I want to just um, open with this sign, we build together. And this expression, we build together, was sort of one of the themes that emerged to think about the Indaba over the last year. And so this is sort of why I'm so excited to be here today, to build with you and for us to build a new kind of future, new sets of technology, new kinds of teams, new kinds of friendships together. So thank you to all the organizers, to Delali, to Augustine, to Asera for having here. Um, as I was telling a few people, even in Mzansi, which is sometimes what we call South Africa, which just means down south, even down south, we always think about Ghana, we support the football, think about the great lessons of Kwame Nkrumah. So it's really such an honor and I'm really excited to be here today to be in this energy of the spirit. So. Um, as we are here yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we are here for this idea which is called the Indaba X. And the deep learning Indaba, maybe three years ago, was created with this mission in mind to strengthen machine learning in Africa. And at that point, it would have been very difficult to say, where is machine learning in Africa? If I would go back to South Africa, even to my old university, which is shown in this image, I wouldn't know who was there. I didn't know if there was anything. But fortunately now, three years later, if you look in this room, it's such a different kind of scene. We have so much more energy. And so this is where we began in 2017. There were three people at the annual deep learning in Daba. And in Indaba is just a Zulu word, which means a meeting, a gathering. And then, of course, this expression, which I just said to you, masakane. Masakane means this word, we build together. And that was the theme for last year's Indaba. And this is an expression which comes from a speech of one of our other great African leaders, Nelson Mandela. And during this time, he was in 1996, he asked us as South Africans to build our country together. And he said this particular expression, that what we need to be as South Africans and as Africans in general was a partnership of a community determined to take responsibility for its own upliftment. And really the reason we are here today in these kind of meetings, like the Indaba X, is to do that responsibility, to build that community ourselves and for us to be responsible to do that. So of course the Indaba X is now created with a very specific reason in mind, and that is to create leadership in AI in every single country in our continent. And this, this is what you are. You are the leaders of AI in Ghana. And this year, I'm very proud to have 27 other countries. So as you are sitting here in this room, the thing I want you to think about is that there are 26 other countries on our continent from South Africa, Senegal, to Tunisia, to Morocco, all who are doing the very same thing you are doing. They are meeting new people and making new friends. They are learning together. They are struggling. They are asking the question which came up earlier. How do I make that transition? So I think this is really something special. And think about that as you are sitting here, that actually you are not alone. You are with the Indaba X in Senegal, what happened two weeks ago. You are with the Indaba X in Uganda. You are with the Indaba X in Tunisia. You are, even where I, where from my home country, the Indaba in South Africa. Here in Lusaka, the Indaba in Zambia. And of course, the first time, the Indaba X in Somalia. So really so much energy and so many people all committed to the same idea. And we build together with them, for all of us. Indaba X in Lesotho, in the mountain kingdom, the Maluti Mountain. And of course, tomorrow, as you are here in Rwanda, they will be having their Indaba X in Kigali. And in two weeks' time, we will have the Indaba X in, in the Gambia. And two weeks after that, we will end up in Blantyre in Malawi. And so I think there's something really special for us to remember that there are many others who are with us here today doing exactly as we are doing. So it's really, and this is why it's such an honor to be standing here and speaking to you and to remember all of these people. So I'm actually, um, so that's basically this idea. Masakane, we build together, and I, if you just remember that, then I think I've done my job. But I'm actually here to talk about something else, which is statistical machine learning 
from principles to practice. So I've given you a little bit of my hat. I am one of the leads of the deep learning in Daba, but otherwise I'm a research scientist at DeepMind and where some of the questions which are here are all the time. And I want to just take you through a path of the foundations of thinking about statistics and machine learning and how they come together. And I'm going to touch on a lot of things that you've just heard from Mustafa already. And so hopefully we'll try and connect those together. So I would like you to all just take one minute to speak to your neighbor. If you know your neighbor, then that's great. If you don't, please introduce yourself. And if you could just ask your neighbor one question, what is machine learning? And if you can just discuss for one minute, and then I want us to discuss afterwards, watch it. So please. Okay, so, so that was our question for the morning, what is machine learning? So just given some of the conversations you had, would a few of you just tell me what, you, what was your answer or what the answer you heard was? Is there anyone who will just please uh, shout out an answer for me? At the back, please. Basically, machine learning is applicable. Okay, so the answer was machine learning is the ability of machines to learn without being explicitly programmed. I think this is a great definition. This ability of, they're still programming, but there's a different kind of programming, and that's sort of what's coming up. Can I have another definition? In the front, please. Machine that is learning. Yes, that's an important. I think the ability of machine that is learning is is a very important one, and maybe we'll ask the question of what is learning later on at the back. So machine learning is the hybrid of computer science and mathematics. A beautiful definition. Thank you. There was another one, um, two at the back over there. We want machines to um, learn things in the data without specifically telling it how to or what to learn. Mm -hmm. So the, qu the answer here was that the way the machine must learn is by discovery, through automatic. We don't need to tell it explicitly, do this, then do this. We don't write a sequence of if statements. Thank you. More? Okay. Um, it's, it's the ability of the computer to derive a formula from associated x and y. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So this is now at least giving us a different kind of definition. Machine learning is about building formulas or graphs or functions that take from an input to an output. Excellent. There was one more maybe in the front. Machine learning is the ability to teach a machine to perform human level tasks. Hmm. Really nice. So machine learning is the ability to teach a machine to do human-like tasks. Thank you. Was there any one last person that was dying to shout out an answer for us? Mustafa, please. <laughs> 
machine learning is linear regression. Machine learning <laughs> is linear regression. Thank you. And um, if linear regression is unfamiliar, we're going to talk about that a little bit um, in the front. Okay, thank you. So I think I always ask this question to every place I speak at, what is machine learning? Because I think it's important for us to recognize that, if you, that there are many ways to describe machine learning. And what you should not do is try to look for some pure, pristine, original version of machine learning. That kind of thinking got left behind 100 years ago. All we have is the way of moving forward, and we are looking for tools to help us build together and move forward. So I'm going to give you my definition of machine learning, which I think will touch with a lot of you. And when I describe it, I will say that machine learning gives us a pathway to move from principles to practice. And I'm going to explain to you sort of what I mean by that. So at the beginning of this, I want you to think of a hierarchy. We have a set of principles. These are the basic tools of mathematics. Probability theory, Bayesian analysis, asymptotic theory. When I get the time to upgrade this image, um, there should be other things. There should be things like neuroscience in there, cognitive sciences. There should be things like physics as well, utility theory. These are the principles that if you have them, you can already do a lot. They are entire areas of study in themselves. But if you can put those things together, you can build a new level, a sort of informational level, a level of things that lets you represent things like uncertainties, what do you know and what you don't know. Can you talk about information gain? When I do an experiment, when I see more data, do I learn something different from what I already know? And how can I always push myself to learn new things, can you learn that something that you do has an effect on the world or it does not, what we call causality? Can you make predictions? Can you do as the person at the back said, take X in and get out Y? And with those informational quantities, we can start doing the things that another answer came up, those tasks of reasoning. How is it that we can start planning to do tasks, complicated sequences, fly from London to Accra? How can we explain what is going on in the world? When I see an image, how do I explain what is in that image, like the image captioning that we saw? How can I understand that the world is made up of many different objects? There are people, there are chairs, there is this room, and all these objects are related to each other. These are the reasoning tasks. And if we pull that together, then we might be able to build these sets of products. The products that we are all imagining that will have that impact in the world. Those assistive technologies that help people who cannot hear or who cannot see to speak better. The ways we advance our science to build new kinds of energy tools, to deal with our changing climate, to address the issues of healthcare, to build those self-driving cars. And so one of the things that comes up from these kind of hierarchy, this kind of pathways, is that all of us, no matter where we are in our careers, no matter the knowledge level we have, we will be sitting at different places. Some of us will be at the very top, and others will be at the very bottom or in between. And we will all, based on the things we need to do, navigate this hierarchy up and down, choosing the kind of tools that we need at the right time, and slowly learning, adding more based on the things we need. So one other thing of machine learning which is important is to recognize in this hierarchy that we are effectively a dual field. We are simultaneously a scientific field that needs to advance questions of fundamental importance related to uncertainty, explanation, causality, objects and relations, but at the same time an engineering field which needs to take those applications, those principles, and put them into products in the real world. And if you can find a way to navigate that simultaneous dual vision of science and engineering together, that is sort of why machine learning is so exciting to me and I think why it is so exciting to everyone else across our continent and beyond. So I have another question. Could a few or anyone tell me what they think the definition of probability is? So what is probability? Please, anyone. So the answer was uh, the likelihood of an event happening. This is a great uh, definition and we should unpack later what likelihood means. But um, this comes up as one, please, in the front. 
The science of uncertainty and probabilities are ways of characterizing uncertainty. It's not the only way, but this is another very good definition. Does anyone else have a view on probability? On this side of them, please. Mm -hmm. So here we recognize that there's a scale from 1 to 10, and what point do I give on, this, on that scale, and that will tell me something about its probability. Very good. One last one, perhaps? Yes? The success over total outcome. Beautiful. So I think um, this is another important thing. Always ask the fundamental question. So, in fact, asking the question of what is probability is a very unfair question because even today this becomes one of the most difficult questions in the philosophy of science. Today we have not resolved what is probability and there are many different definitions of probability, at least five that I can think of. I'm going to share with you four of my favorite ones which overlap with some of the ones that you have said and some of the others. So the first one is the one that came up with the rating from 1 to 10 with this question of likelihood. Um, and what the person said at the back, what is called the statistical probability. It is the frequency of events taking place. When I roll the dice, for example, that how many times does the dice come up? One, it should be one out of six. That is the frequency ratio. So this is this definition of statistical probability. You have other definitions. One of them, which didn't come up in our conversation, was this idea of logical probability. That probability is only useful if you can say that a hypothesis, a logical hypothesis, is possible or not. So we make a statement, is something true or not? And you can make a degree to which it is true. And that's sort of this logical probability. The one that is coming up from the earlier definition of machine learning that came up from various people was this propensity definition. Probability is propensity. Propensity is just another word for prediction in this case. So probabilities in this definition are only useful if they are useful for prediction. Um, and the one which is the one that I will ask you to remember and to use in your everyday is this definition which is called subjective probability. The probability is something that you use to describe beliefs. And why this one is so powerful is that everything, you can have a belief about anything. You can have a question about the probability of this flower, of this room. You can ask questions the probability of chairs, of people. And in that kind of view of probability, Everything you see can become data, and then we can reason about data in many different ways. And so that is the reason that it allows us to apply probability to everything we think of and see. And so I guess one of the things why I love probability as a field of mathematics so much is that probability is sufficient for the task of reasoning under uncertainty, which is the thing we do every day in our lives. So probability now becomes that central foundation stone of the work of machine learning, of AI, of data science, of the way of taking that pathway from principles to products. So as you are now beginning to think about probability and you are thinking about data and the realm of data science, there are basically four things that you are doing in the world and I wanted to describe these four things. You are either enumerating data and this just means how you collect your data. Where does the data come from? Who was asked the data and who was not asked the data. This becomes a very important operation and is a statistical operation in itself. You have entire fields dedicated to asking the question of how it is you can get data, especially in medicine. And then typically once you have data there are two kinds of things you are going to do. One is going to be this task of summarization. You are going to ask in all the data that you have seen, what is it that makes all those data points alike? Why is it that those data points are similar? And this operation, when you're asking that question of your data, we can call that summarization. The opposite of summarization is what we'll call comparison. Why is it that this data point is different from another data point? How is it that data points are all different from each other? Can we search for data points that are very different from each other in some point? Of course, these are related. Typically what we will say when we think about data in this context of summarization, we will talk about the topic of modeling. And if we are talking about this idea of data and comparisons, we will think about what was called an experimental design, how it is we get the data. 
and of course summarization and comparison live side by side because they are very closely related. One asks about similarities, the other asks about differences. And of course, once you have data and a way of describing that data, then we have the central element of this kind of four operations, which we call inference. Inference, in general, is a way to connect the data that you have to a model that you designed. And when we think about this kind of models for inference, we'll talk about estimation and learning theory. And on the other side, when we are thinking of comparison and the task of inference, we will call this typically testing or hypothesis testing. So these now become four basic operations. You don't need to actively think about them, but it's useful to know that these are the things that you are actually doing. And you will always be doing these things. And with each, each of these things, you can do a lot of work and unpack for them. Um, so let's just think about this question now of models themselves. What is a model? Let's begin with that definition. A model is just a description of the world, a description of data, a description of some kind of outcomes that can happen after doing some action in the world. So that is basically a model. All models can be described this way, whether they are described by a set of linear equations, whether they are described by a set of differential equations or a sequence, a transformation of objects. You get a special type of model, which we'll call probabilistic model. And a probabilistic model writes out that description of the world using the rules of probability. And so that's, this is sort of what makes a probabilistic model. And so here's an example of a probabilistic model that you can just come up off the top of your head. I have a traffic jam here in the streets of Accra. Um, we have a peak hour. And there are several other things which are affecting the way traffic works. And the only thing that I can see that I can measure is that there is a traffic jam. I know that this event is there. So, if you were to write this as a probabilistic model, you can ask now many questions about this kind of traffic system in Accra. You can say, well, what is the probability of there being a traffic jam in general, on average, over all times of the day, at any time of the year? And you'll find that this might be very high. Um, you can ask certain what we'll call conditional probabilities. What is the probability that there is a siren given that there was an accident? So I'm just trying to explain this notation of the bar. It says probability of a siren given that an accident had occurred. So there's sort of an ordering which is happening. What is the probability that things are peak hours given that are traffic jams? How can I guess? The underlying causes of a traffic jam, in this case, is it the peak hour? And then, so most models in machine learning are probabilistic. Sometimes they don't look probabilistic because there are many ways of writing. That is one of the powers of mathematics. But in the end, most of them are probabilistic because uncertainties and these kind of questions are the questions we want to ask of machine learning. So probabilistic models will let you learn probability distributions of data. And as I said before, data can be anything. And then you can choose what to learn about those probability distributions. Probability distributions have many characteristics. Some of them is just the central line, which is called the mean. And then you have other more complicated things, the entire distribution. What can happen at very rare events, at frequent events, and so there are many things you get to decide. So this now, if we look at those four operations, of them, artificial intelligence will in some sense be the most refined instantiation of these four operations. It will ask us to do the most advanced way of collecting data we can think of. The most advanced way of asking how data points are the same and how they are different. And importantly, it will ask us the most advanced way of trying to learn models from that data and ask questions of probability. And there's a reason I put this thing of inference at the top, because inference becomes that key driver, and for me, then almost becomes the core question of artificial intelligence. How can we advance the state and science of inference, because that is then um, what we do. And I spend most of my own research thinking about this question of probabilistic inference and how we advance that. So I wanted to just say that although I've described those four operations, they are not enough. Typically, we want to do two things. We want to do inference, but we want to do one other task, which is really the key task of AI, which is called decision making. And I want to just separate these two terms of inference and decision making. So as I said, what is inference? Inference is the way to connect the data that you have 
to a model that you have designed. And so inference asks the question of what you can know about your data. Can you know certain probabilities? Can you know that there was a siren given that there's a traffic jam or an accident? So this is just about a state of knowledge describing the world and understanding the data that we have. Most of the work of the data scientist is related to this task of inference because we are given data about cellular users, about customers, about mobile money transactions, and we need to explain what's going on. But usually we always need to do one other thing, and that's what decision making is about. It's not about what you can know, but it's about what you can do with your data. And typically the task of inference will come before the task of decision making. But these are the two things that we are sort of jumping between and basically from what I've described to you we are basically trying to build those pathways from principles to products that make decisions and so we have many of these tools and these tools are sometimes what we we'll call plausible reasoning systems we have flexible ways of building probabilistic models we have the ability to make consistent inferences based on data and maintain beliefs that definition of subjective probability and then we can reason using our models and probabilities different kind of outcomes whether they are good or bad and then make decisions so this is sort of the core so now we're going to just jump into a second phase so here was Mustafa's definition of machine learning linear regression linear regression is the foundation of every model in statistics, in machine learning, in AI. If you are dealing with data, linear regression is the foundation of that thinking. So linear regression, and I'm going to describe um, a more general version of it, which is called the generalized linear regression, and has something of the follows. Um, so let's just read this equation. It's, it's a, this is an equation for a straight line. So linear regression, and that's the why, a reason it's called linear, just says that data points can be described by a straight line. Now, of course, if you go beyond 2D, there's still an idea of a straight line, planes and hyperplanes. So it says that we have data, which is X, which you can shift by an offset, which is B, and you can combine the data points together using a set of parameters, weights, sometimes they're called coefficients, these things W. So this thing, eta, is called a predictor, and this predictor is a straight line. And typically, this is now how we get the probabilistic model out of that. The straight line is then pushed through some function, which then puts it into the right domain of probability, and then we can assign a probability distribution. So let me just make this a bit more concrete. So if you're just thinking about a set of pictures in a block, you have data in, and then you form this kind of operation, a big matrix of numbers, B times X, that fills this first line of eta forming the predictor. This predictor gets pushed through a function which may reduce the numbers to 0 and 1, for example, or make sure that they are all only positive, or it will do some rescaling. And that number that you get out of that describes the probability distribution of your data. And so the choice of this P and the choice of G, there are many different choices that you have available, huge long tables of things. Um, I'll point out one. So if you have um, this probability is a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution, then G is just the identity, there's no need to use it. If you had data which was 0 or 1, binary data, then this G is called the sigmoid function, which squashes the output to 0 and 1. One thing which is very popular in uh, deep learning, which is called the rectified linear function, in economics they will call that the Tobit model, would be to use this G function as um, a rectifier, which is just zero everything that's less than zero and then leaves it the same if it's uh, greater than zero. And so this basic operation here, this linear function can be anything. It can be a convolution, it can be affine functions as I have up here. Any kinds of linear operations can be combined and this is the basis of linear regression. And then this function g which I've hidden there is called this inverse link function and there are many choices of this inverse link function and in deep learning and modern machine learning most people will call this inverse link function which is its name in statistics they will call it an activation function and then you will have these set of parameters the w and the b that's what i'm calling theta here they now need to be trained somehow the data need to tell you what those values are and this is sort of what we'll do we'll take the log of this probability distribution and then we can take the derivative of this probability distribution with respect to theta so this second part, um, so actually let me just say a little bit about deep networks. As I said, um, 
the linear model says the world can be described by straight lines but the real world doesn't really have straight lines it looks more like this some complicated wavy it's very non-linear it has lots of bumps and changes and abrupt uh, switches so what you can instead do is do a recursive composition of that basic linear function and if you do that basic recursive composition so if this bottom box is that linear regression it forms a linear predictor pushes it through some nonlinear function this activation function you can just write a piece of code that sequences these kind of linear predictors together one on top of the other so that we call a recursive or um, linear model or recursive generalized linear model and so that kind of structure is then what we could call a deep network or a deep neural network if you want to call this kind of operation a neural operation and so basically it does this kind of composition of functions form the first linear predictor blue box take it again pass it through as many as you like and you can do this as many times as you like and this is sort of the question of depth how many layers of these operations can you get so if this is just a linear function it's a set of matrices and you do it this way you'll get what is called a multi-layer perceptron if the B is implemented through a set of convolutions then this recursive functions will recover a convolutional neural network and then of course if the B is the same in every layer of this model then that will give you a dynamical system or a recurrent model so you can do a lot already in this framework and it all begins with that basic building block of linear regression and so deep networks then give us a very flexible, very general framework for building very powerful models. And that is the reason why they're so successful today. And they are nonlinear, and I'm using this word parametric because they have lots of parameters, these betas and thetas and e's. So to learn these parameters is the realm of estimation theory. And there are many different ways of doing what this problem of estimation. And so estimation begins with writing out a probabilistic model. As I said, you write a probability that describes the world. So we have data X, which has some description H, and then we assign a probability to that. The likelihood function, which came up earlier, in this case is the log likelihood function, is the log of that probability distribution. And then because you have many different data points, you will sum that over the end data points that you have. And the reason it is called a likelihood because it's a function of parameters theta. So likelihoods are objects which tell you how good parameters you, ha you have in explaining your data. So if I change theta and I get a better likelihood, then that tells me it explains my data better. So likelihoods are things to think about that are, are parameters. And then this question of maximum likelihood, which is the most popular way of training uh, machine learning models just takes the ma computes the derivative and maximizes this function but there are many other ways of doing this kind of estimation theory you don't need to do just maximum likelihood um, because it has its own limitations and so this is where we do this work of estimation theory of doing more research to figure out all the disadvantages of this estimation theory we can try and fix there's a very different way of doing this um, estimation theory. One of them is called Bayesian analysis. And I wanted to introduce it because you'll hear it very often. So Bayesian analysis asks you to do something a little bit more. Rather than making a single prediction of something happening, it will ask you to predict a whole distribution. So it's not just what is the most probable thing, but it asks you also to make predictions about what things are improbable and less probable. So that's basically what happens here. Instead of just making a single number of theta, which is what happens after optimization, I want a distribution of theta. And so this is the core principle of Bayesian analysis. It takes this idea of describing the world in probabilities to its limit. It says that everything in the world must be described with a probability, even the parameters that you put to design a model. And so Bayesian reasoning can be done in many, many ways. So I usually think there are right now two major streams of thinking in machine learning. One of them is deep learning, which we've been thinking a lot about. Deep learning gives you a way to build very rich, nonlinear models for classification, sequence prediction, and many, many other tasks. It is very scalable. It helps you do stochastic approximation, which is this idea of using mini batches. And it's conceptually very simple. As we described, you take these basic linear building blocks and you recursively compose them and you can build very powerful things. And it's easily composed with other kinds of ways of learning with gradients. So once you have gradients, they can all be fitted together to build big models. But as I said, the main idea was that we only have these single 
predictions that we are making. We optimize a single set of parameters. So those are called point estimates. And it's sometimes very hard to score a model, to say why is it good, how is it better than something else, how you do the task of choosing the best model. On the other hand, you have this element of Bayesian reasoning, which says that everything in the world must be given a probability distribution. They have disadvantages that really to do good Bayesian models, in the old days at least, they would have to be only models of this linear form, straight line. And even if you did something more complicated, learning probability distributions is very complicated, so it became a very difficult task. But if you do work in the Bayesian framework, what you have is a very unified way of thinking about everything. Model building, doing inference, scoring those models, selecting amongst them, regularizing them, and doing decision making. You can explicitly account for uncertainty in Bayesian kinds of models, which were some of the themes which came up in your earlier discussion. And uh, this question of overfitting, it is very robust to overfitting for model selection and composition. So, of course, I'm showing you this slide because the disadvantages of one side are the advantages of the other side and vice versa. So it's very natural to combine these two areas of machine learning together and some of my own research has been to do exactly that work of combining deep learning with Bayesian analysis and to look at the kind of applications that we have. So in machine learning you would have heard that there are three kind of things we describe. We have supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning and I wanted to just expand that concept in a different set of slides. So, supervised learning are these tasks of what we call regression and classification. Regression and classification are effectively the same word. Classification is just a regression for discrete outcomes, so things that are binary, for example. So, here's a probabilistic model. You have some parameters. Because you want it to be Bayesian, even those parameters must have probability distributions. We design a model which describes how we think the world works. In this case, our data goes through some function, which is maybe a neural network in this case, and then the outcome of that function is described by a certain probability, which is going to give a probability over certain categories, or a categorical distribution. So if we had a dice, you would have six categories. And then one of the operations of probability is to say, what is the probability of the parameters theta given the data x and y? So this will, of course, describe every classification model you have seen. The ones like ImageNet, for example, um, have this kind of form. Data goes in, label comes out, like the definition that came from the back. And we can use this to make predictions of the future based on past correlations in our data. But the thing you can't do with this is to say that, oh, if I changed x, what would happen to y? You can't ask what if questions from this kind of a model because that would change the underlying structure. That becomes a causal question. So keep that in mind. The second kind of thing that is called unsupervised learning in statistics will be called density estimation, amongst many other things. And density estimation says, what if I don't have any labels? Can I still learn? from my data. And that's exactly what we want to do. Can you assign probability to data itself in the absence of labels? And you can learn from data. Um, this is a way of discovering the structure in your data. As I said, this is called unsupervised learning. And in the work that I do, it's in a particular area called deep generative models. And so here's an example of a model if you've ever used something called PCA. PCA fits in this category and is described by the probabilistic model. I have some underlying principal components, some compression of the data, which I don't know. But what I do see is data in the real world, which is very high dimensional, it's very complicated, it's very noisy. How can I find this low dimensional projection? And PCA says, well, if you describe everything by Gaussians, then you will be able to describe that kind of operation. And so it's very neat that algorithms that you think are just linear algebra also have a very deep probabilistic foundation. And then the final one is this question of decision making. Decision making always operates within an environment. You are the decision maker, you take certain actions, your actions affect the world, and then the world gives you something that you can observe. You see a change, I move this flower, I see its motion, or I pay some money, I see the product come back. So you get those observations, and this loop of moving between action and observation is called a perception action loop, and that is sort of 
the question of decision making and if we were to do that in this kind of probabilistic framework we would say that we have some probability distribution over the actions we can take in the world if we take an action and then we apply it in the world we can measure something from our environment and then from the environment we can say something is good or not about doing that action we can assign a reward or a utility I invested some money and I made a return that is a reward or I studied hard for the exam and I passed the test that is the kind of a reward that we can do and this kind of loop is then very powerful and all of reinforcement learning is based on this and you have a way of seeing reinforcement learning through the lens of probability so there are many applications I'm gonna overlap with a lot that you heard already I combine these applications to three groups products which are one of them these questions of compression super resolution very fast uh, text-to-speech we have the ways of advancing science things like proteomics medicine drug discovery high energy physics fusion and then the questions of AI those kind of reasoning tasks that we want to do very complex planning tools ways of doing model based RL ways of exploring the world so this was the one that you saw which was based on machine translation I think this is one of those that we stand to do many more interesting applications as people in this room begin to work on other kinds of languages Google Translate operates in 102 languages but obviously not many of the 2000 languages that are on the African continent so then there's this idea of reducing energy what you can do is take measurements of the heat and hot water in these pipes and by building that kind of loop of decision making and action and prediction you can then try and set the controls of these kind of energy systems to reduce their energy consumption this is the Google data center this is what they look like and this is actually used to control the energy usage of Google data centers um, compression becomes a very important tool especially if we need to serve data over low bandwidth tasks and so a lot of new kind of work in probabilistic modeling on deep learning and generative models is around this question of can we do compression can I send a very low resolution image to the user and on their phone give them a very high resolution so from this image to that image at the end and so lots of interesting work in that area there are many of these assistive tools, the tools like Alexa's and Google Homes that you, you talk to that you then can respond to you. So these are models are based on um, these days what are called conditional generative models. They are conditional because they are operate on sequences. So this thing is conditioned on things that come in the past. And this exact model is actually what is in production in Google systems, which is called WaveNet. And they are based, based on a set of what are called linguistic features and they give you out a set of linguistic features that are then transformed into sound this is a really fun one that I thought um, what someone did was they created this kind of tool and you would just draw and what this tool would do would generate for you a filled in version of that image so this is a model called pix to pix and I think these are the kind of interesting things that happen that when we do our research and you put it out there in the world you actually are never sure what people will do with your with your work so here's another fun one um, these are um, what's going on here is that on the side there's a camera looking on this piece of cloth and by training a lot of machine learning algorithms on paintings what it's doing is taking the scene and generating this scene here so again this is a person who's doing a PhD in arts and digital art and this is pretty pretty interesting I think just to see and there's some kind of bizarre sound effects in this video um, but I think that's kind of an interesting kind of creative, new kind of creative tool to come up. <laughs> I'm just going to so you can see one other bit. I always think this is a really fun part um, where they have this sort of Sauron hand. Um, this is another video which is called Style Transfer you have videos on the right these are the raw videos and again they are trained on lots of samples of zebras and horses and then sort of what you can do is process this thing to be then basically give you transform the horse into a zebra and you sort of learned lots of the underlying bits of it you learn that zebras usually don't exist in places with green grass we have savannas in all our countries and so the grass becomes a bit browner the motion becomes there it's sort of still unnatural but I think that was a really fun kind of thing and you can see many different ways of doing this kind of style transfer from Monet paintings from real images to painting styles horse to zebra from winter to summer or back so I think that's really really fun then there are of course the interesting questions here this is the question of 
dealing with stellar initial mass functions. Stellar initial mass functions are the function that you would want to guess if you were trying to explain the origins of the universe and the birth of stars. And so there are ways of creating simulators of stellar initial mass functions that can generate data. And once we build these simulators of data, we can le learn models to infer backwards the parameters of those models that explain how stellar functions or mass functions emerge. Um, and so then there are many other ways of advancing physics. These are called calorimeters, and this is from image from the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, and in all of these cases, they are using machine learning to detect that question of comparison. How is it that this experiment is different from ones before? And if you can detect something that's different, then you can maybe discover new fundamental particles. We spoke a bit um, with Mustafa about electronic health records. This is sort of what an electronic health record looks like. It sort of takes for every patient a long point in time different kinds of things about their life. Measurements of health, vital signs, medications, operations, outpatients that they have had. It turns nonlinear data into a sequential representation. And when the data is put in a sequential form, we can then make all these kind of predictions, length of stay, certain ca cardiovascular risks, when should certain interventions be taken? When should fluids be given? So this is pretty interesting. But I think in our cases, many of our countries are very far from having electronic health records. So I do always wonder what the way of creating a new kind of digital medicine in South Africa, in Ghana, in any other countries, when you don't yet have this kind of infrastructure and what that looks like. And then the question you saw earlier about um, diabetic retinopathy, this is a different kind of medical imaging in the eye, which is called optical coherence tomography, OCT. And OCT does a different kind of thing. It just slices the levels of the eye because you can actually also detect disease in the eye. And then you want to use these kind of convolutional neural networks to automatically segment these kind of images. But they're also used here for breast cancer mammography and in a paper that came out in Nature several years ago about cancer detection. Um, and then the one we also mentioned earlier, which is around molecular structures. Can you build generative models that can help you generate these kind of molecules? And if you can do that with a machine, then you can accelerate this sort of drug discovery cycle. So how is it that you are going to now approach your own machine learning and work, given all these kind of, all these kind of applications and foundations? So I will always ask you to think of a very human-centered and interdisciplinary approach to your work. And in psychology, if you were to read, they would ask you to operate on this kind of a hierarchy. I really like it because it starts at the bottom. It says that there are these physiological things we will build. There are predictions. There are other kinds of tasks. There's a componential level which starts building them together, putting predictions together to make uncertainties and question our judgments. A psychological level which is about what we think, what we believe, and then importantly it recognizes the importance of sociology. That we don't live alone, that we exist with a society, and our models exist with other humans in a society. Um, when you're thinking of machine learning, what you need to do is think about two different kinds of frameworks. One of them is called this architecture loss framework, and the other one is called a model inference and algorithm framework. So these are the two that you need to sort of be able to jump between. The architecture loss is the one that if you have used any form of TensorFlow, you would already know. It involves first building a set of computational graphs, which is taking data in, describing all the sequences of operations that will happen to reach an output, and then to do some form of error propagation to look at the output of that model and then go backwards through your computational graph. There are many, many different ways of doing this kind of architecture and loss. And this is the most powerful and sort of uh, widely used way of thinking that people have today. This is sort of how TensorFlow is built. TensorFlow is built on this principle of building computational graphs and then propagating errors through the graphs to do the task of learning. I work with a slightly more um, richer version, which I call the models. So it, ask you to recognize that every problem that you work on has a set of models. Combined with those models are a set of learning principles. And then you have a set of algorithms that combine a set of models and learning principles together. And you have many different kinds of models, which you are going to begin with as you begin with your task. Some are called directed and undirected models. Other are called fully observed, like that WaveNet model we described. Some are latent variable models, like the task of PCA that I said. And then the others are these 
other complicated versions, parametric, non-parametric, semi-parametric. All of these have been used in machine learning and deep learning today, and all of them have very different kinds of use cases. Then you have um, these kind of learning principles. How is it that question of estimation theory that we learn the parameters of our model? I break this kind of statistical inference into two parts. Either there are direct inferences or there are indirect inferences. Direct inferences are inferences which ask questions about this probability directly of your model. And you've seen lots of them. The one I described was maximum likelihood. I spent a lot of my work in this area of variational inference, but there are many, many ways of learning parameters of a model. That's if you can describe its probability. But for many models, you can't describe its probability. And that's where these indirect methods of estimation come in. And if you have heard about a model which are called generative adversarial network, for example, they use this principle of two-sample testing as the way of doing their statistical inference. Now that you have models, and now that you actually know how to train those models, you can combine them together to form many interesting kinds of algorithms. For example, you could build a convolutional neural network, which is a model. You can combine that with a method of statistical inference, which is called penalized maximum likelihood, and you would get some kind of algorithm, like the inception net model of EGG, which will then can be implemented in various different ways, optimization, different kinds of regularization, and tasks in various ways. You get other kinds of latent variable models plus variational inference, which gives you different kind of algorithms. You have restricted Boltzmann machines and maximum likelihood, which will give you a different kind of algorithm. And then you have implicit generative models and two sample testing, which will give you things like generative adversarial networks or other kinds of um, models. So if you can keep this kind of thinking in mind, then the reason to have it is that you can realize that for any model, you can have many different inference principles, and the way to do good comparisons is to be able to compare them in various different ways. Um, I want to end with a sort of message which Mustafa also ended with, which is for us to be very critical about how we deploy our machine learning. So here, if you uh, know this person, John Oliver, so this is one of those style transfer, the horse to zebra kind of thing. There's a video of John Oliver here. It is trained to change John Oliver's face into this man, Stephen Colbert's face. And you can do this pretty reliably. You can do this with people's voices. And so now the question is, is that a good thing to do? Is that a safe thing to do? Is that an ethical thing to do? Is that the thing that we actually want to do? And so we need to think very carefully about how it is that we use our algorithms. And so I think sort of the question which someone asked earlier, one of the ways that we deal with this is to form teams of people that are very interdisciplinary, very diverse. The reason Google, Google needs to be here in Ghana is that it gives it one new lens of thinking about how we build this critical practice for machine learning. And this is a new kind of machine learning that we are going to build together through the IndabaX communities, through all our research that we're doing. So I want to leave you um, with the technical terms which are used when you're thinking about this area. They will ask you always to think that every technology has a dual use. Technologies can be used for good, but they can also be used for bad. And that requires us to assess the values with which we are assigning to those technologies. And that question they call value alignment. How do you align the values of a society with the way that technology is used? And so two topics in this kind of era come up. One is neutrality, and another one is called universality. So, I want to just tell you a little bit about neutrality. Neutrality means that you assume somehow that your model, your machine learning algorithm is neutral. There are four traps of thinking which happen when this happens. One, you will assume that your model is somehow very portable, that the data you trained it on, this country you tested it on, the people, the men only in the cohort, for example, that it's somehow portable to when you test it to women or to other kinds of populations. So a formalism trap comes up that we think, as much as I have described the wonders of probability theory, probability theory cannot describe the whole world. I cannot really solve all the complex problems of the world by formalizing it through a set of probabilities. That requires us to do the hard work of working together in teams with people, with our communities and governments. A ripple effect trap, which is that you don't understand that when you do something, it has other implications. 
So when we create generative models that can do style transfer, we don't imagine that people are going to be then transforming horses to zebras or transforming um, John Oliver into Stephen Colbert. So that's this ripple effect. And the solutionism trap is the one that is very easy for us to fall into, is to assume that all technology, if we have a problem, technology is the way we are going to solve that problem. And these days, that takes a different form. If we have a problem, healthcare, water, sanitation, energy, AI, and machine learning is the solution to that problem. So that's the solutionism trap. So we should just think not to fall into those traps. Another one is called this idea of universality. I'm just going to read this because it comes from a really nice book. It says, a monocultural view of ethics conceives itself as the only valid one. In order to avoid this kind of ethical chauvinism and colonialism, it is necessary that transcultural ethics, I like this term, arises from an intercultural dialogue instead of thinking of itself as universal without noticing its own cultural bias. Now, of course, Kapura works in social sciences and these kind of critical theories, but I think he's making the point to us that we must work in this era of transcultural ethics, that there are many cultures involved, and how do we deal with the kind of ethics of that? And these kind of transcultural ethics comes through this process. It's a field of itself, which is called intercultural dialogue or intercultural ethics as well. So if some of you are in this room thinking about where you want to work, there is a great deal of work to work in just this area alone of how it is we form those kind of intercultural digital ethics and not fall into the trap of ethical socialism and a new kind of colonialism. So I want to just end. I'm a great proponent of these, what I call the sustainable development goals. I think now that you have been through this path, we are thinking about what it is with machine learning needs to happen. You will ask the question, where do you find those sources of problems? Perhaps you know some of them already. But in all the history of the world, there has actually been only one agreement which every country on our planet has agreed to, and that is this, which is called the Global Agenda for 2030, which is the Sustainable Development Goal. And I think that's really important just to think about. Every country on our planet has agreed that there are these 17 problems that we need to work on. And in these 17 problems, each of them comes with a set of measures which you can use to track our performance. Some of them are very critical. And if you are looking for sources of problems, places for machine learning, data science to have some impact to form those kind of intercultural panels and multidisciplinary teams, the Sustainable Development Goal are one of those very powerful frameworks for us to think and work with. So ultimately, I think machine learning is a source of joy. I hope you will have some joy and enjoy this next day and the rest of today. It really has been a pleasure and honor to be with you today. Thank you for having me and thank you for your attention. Thank you.